Dr. Fahim Mohammed is on faculty here um, in our pediatric physical medicine and rehab group. He did his combined bachelor's in medical degree at University of uh, Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. Did his internship and residency in San Antonio at UT uh, Health Center, UT yeah, uh, Health Science Center, and then a fellowship in pediatric rehab at UC Davis, um, and is here with us now in our pediatric rehab department. He'll be talking to us today about adaptive sports. All right, thank you guys. Um, let's see. So today um, we're going to be talking about adaptive sports. Um, I have no financial disclosures. So uh, just a little bit of in introduction about adaptive sports and how they came into play. So um, basically they originated here in the U.S. Um, back in the mid-20th century um, uh, when the wars were going on. Uh, you, they had, there was a bunch of injured war veterans um, that uh, in the hospitals when they're doing their rehab, uh, they would do races down the hallways of the hospital. And so um, that kind of initiated the first um, interest in like uh, wheelchair racing. That was one of the first wheelchair sports, uh, more adaptive sports uh, that came into play. Um, fast forward to today, you'll be hard pressed to find that uh, any recreational or uh, sporting opportunity that does not have an adaptive, uh, adapted form. Um, and so uh, sports and recreation, at least in my field, um, play a vital role in rehabilitation of my kiddos and a lot of the, the, the patients that I see. Um, and so that's why I have a, a huge passion for it. So a um, little bit more history. Um, sorry, I'm a history buff. Um, but uh, a, philanthropist, a philanthropist by the name of uh, Eunice Kennedy Shriver, um, she championed these camps um, back in the 1960s um, that uh, were for kids with like intellectual disabilities uh, and gave them an opportunity to participate in sporting activities and things like that. Um, and through that, the success of that, it led to the development of what uh, the first Special Olympics, which was in 1968. And so currently there's now more than 5 million athletes um, that participate in more than 100,000 different events each year um, and across 172 nations. So um, gotten really big. Um, for the, those of you that don't know the difference, um, there's Special Olympics and there's Paralympics. So Paralympics is more for physically disabled um, uh patients or peoples. Um, the Special Olympics um, incorporates both uh, intellectual and, and physical disabilities. And so uh, 1989 is when the Paralympic Committee was formed. And so the IPC um, hosts uh, the Olympics in the same cities that we do at the regular Olympics. So um, the first uh, games were in uh, Seoul, Korea in 1988. And uh, the winter games, the first winter games were back in 1992 in uh, Albertville, France. So. Um, and since then, there's been development of many more associations. There's now the National Wheelchair Athletic Association. Um, there's lots of different opportunities through um, Boys and Girl Scouts, uh, Little League and such, and we'll get into all that um, here in a little bit too. Um, from a legal perspective, um, back in January two, uh, 2013, um, there, was a, there was a lot of um, fuzz between like, you know, what, what exactly are our schools supposed to be providing for our kids uh, with uh, disabilities in terms of um, sporting activities and access to physical activities. And so we, we know about 504 plans and IEPs. Um, so legally, um, schools are required to um, provide some sort of equal right or equal privilege for kids with um, disabilities or intellectual disabilities with physical or cognitive um, to participate in extra in their school's extra uh, curricular activities and so um, and where there is not an impossible accommodation they're supposed to at least provide an alternative um, uh, activity for them to participate in so um, so why do we even care like what, what's the big deal we all know what um, the importance of physical activity is and how important exercise is um, in fact the same physical activity guidelines that we give to our adults and kids um, without disabilities, um, there's actually similar, fairly similar guidelines for kids with, um, with disabilities. And so um, uh, the US Department of Health actually recommends that ch kids age six to 17 years old um, uh, participate in at least some, some degree of moderate to vigorous uh, activity level for one hour daily. Obviously that's gonna vary, what, what, what does uh, moderate or vigorous intensity mean for somebody with, the, with a physical or cognitive disability? That, that's gonna vary from patient to patient, so. Um, let's see here. So, um, 
how does it impact? So we, we, we talked about how uh, physical activity can impact different realms. And so from a physical aspect, um, we know it can improve our aerobic capacity, um, strength, um, if we're talking about specific populations. Um, for example, cerebral palsy. Um, uh, kids who participated in circuit training uh, showed uh, improved aerobic and anaerobic capacity, um, improved overall health-related quality of life scores um, in treadmill in kiddos that participated in treadmill training with CP, um, significant improvements in balance, endurance, and functional mobility. Um, other populations that I, I commonly see, um, spinal cord injury, um, who are known to have um, lower body fat percentage and overall uh, aerobic capacities, um, they and they re tend to reach physical exhaustion and uh, at lower workloads um, than their unaffected controls. Um, so participation in physical activity can actually improve their lean body mass, um, their strength, their, their power output, and their resting oxygen uptake. Um, joint mobility syndromes, hypermobility, hypomobility syndromes, um, uh, they often have lots of issues with pain, um, higher BMIs because they're not going to be as active um, and lower endurance levels. And so um, they greatly benefit from physical activity as well in terms of improving their overall pain and mobility. Cystic fibrosis is another um, one that we uh, I've gotten an occasion into my clinics as well, but they, they uh, exercise training can improve their aerobic conditioning, muscle strength, oxygen consumption, burn, burn kiddos um, uh, have, tend to have leaner, uh, lower body mass and muscle strength, and so participating in physical activity can actually improve both strength and their um, their their body mass as well. So, um, our juvenile idiopathic arthritis, um, all these different patient populations can uh, can uh, benefit from physical act uh, activity. So, um, beyond just the physical improvements, uh, are the uh, psychosocial implications. So, children with dif disabilities often uh, report feeling stigmatized, like stereotyped. Um, but uh, through adaptive sports and recreation opportunities, um, they're able to build social networks, um, you know, find more independence and freedom, um, and um, positively have positive outlooks on, on themselves and compare themselves to other people. Um, and so um, it's also a great opportunity for families as well um, to network with other um, families that uh, might have kiddos with similar conditions and, uh, and such. So. Um, so you're like, oh, that sounds great, Dr. Mohammed. Um, how do I get my kid uh, involved in adaptive sports and who can I go to? Um, so uh, first place to, uh, that I always look at is, is the school. And so some, some schools have adaptive PE or they should have adaptive PE available. Um, and so their adaptive PE teachers are often some of the first people that give kids the exposure to, to sport, sports um, that they can participate in. Um, child life specialists, therapeutic recreation specialists, PT and OT, um, your friendly neighborhood pedi pediatric, pediatric physiatrist. Um, so um, all of those uh, people can, can help guide um, recommendations for, for adaptive sporting opportunities. Um, therapeutic recreation in particular, they provide services um, to people with um, chronic illnesses and disabling conditions. They're not the same as a child as a specialist, just a, a key point there. Um, their primary purpose is to help improve function and independence and uh, eliminate the effects of illness or disability. That's kind of like the textbook definition for a therapeutic uh, recreational therapist. And so um, they do things from using art, uh, music, dance, um, aquatic interventions, um, play therapy, all, all, all these kind of things. They, they can do activities such as like yoga, um, adventure training, tai chi, all these kind of things is, are what um, therapeutic recreational specialists can, can uh, incorporate. Versus the child life, they're usually embedded here in the hospital and they do, they're more to kind of help, you know, guide therapists or um, help, you know, help with procedures and things like that. So they, they do much more than just um, uh, therapeutic recreational um, specialists. So. Um, let's see here. So it's important to know, you know, our, our, we know that our kiddos with disabilities don't participate a, in uh, as much physical activity and exercise. So what are the, some of the reasons why we might not see that? Some of the more common reported um, uh, barriers or report reasons why kiddos don't participate in physical activities with, with disabilities. Um, so lack of local facilities, um, lack of physical access, transportation issues. Um, there's sort of this kind of like um, 
attitudinal barriers by some, sometimes by public staff and um, uh, people that they encounter. Um, financial concerns is often a big one as well. Um, and then just lack of trained personnel or uh, people who know or are, are aware of um, uh, adaptive sporting opportunities. So. Um, so how can we kind of increase some of these um, uh, participation levels? Uh, so um, finding supportive groups and coaches and teammates, uh, offering opportunities for social socialization. There's tons of different like social media groups where um, families can connect and um, you know, just having a kid meet another kid that's participating in uh, an adaptive sporting opportunity um, can go a long way just to kind of get them to, to go along with it. So. Um, um, another thing that um, my families are always asking, you know, where can I take my kid or how, how can I get them, you know, more active? Um, there are um, lots of accessible uh, playgrounds, believe it or not. The Austin Parks Foundation has a whole list of accessible play, uh, playgrounds for um, kiddos to uh, attend and just, you know, be a, be a regular kid and just go to the playground. Um, there's lots of grassroots organizations um, that can kind of help um, uh, guide you or guide you the resources uh, in your local community. Um, so the American Association of Adapted Sports, um, they are actually employing a model now within schools where they're actually following like, um, you know, how you have like in season, like regular season basketball, soccer and all that. They're, they're doing that for kiddos with disabilities as well. They're forming leagues. Um, they're having tournaments, playoffs and all these kind of things. Um, so Move United Sport, that website there is a really great resource um, if in case you wanted to, to, to learn more about um, different adaptive sporting opportunities, how to get um, equipment covered for your kids. Um, so they're, they're a really great resource to, to look into in, in case you guys are interested. Um, so yeah, another question that comes up often is, you know, how do I get equipment covered um, for my kiddos that want to participate in sports, um, adaptive sports? So uh, insurances most of the time will not cover um, like a sports wheelchair or sporting prosthesis or stuff uh, unless um, you try to embed it with whatever devices that they have already. So um, if I wanted like um, for a wheelchair, for example, a sports wheelchair, um, I the way I've, I've gotten um, approval in the past is that, you know, I've said that this is like a vital component um, for their chair, that, that it's their means of getting exercise. It's a way to prevent injury. You have to provide like a letter of justification for that. Um, and sometimes it'll cover, uh, cover specific components of chairs and, and things like that. Um, uh, otherwise, it's usually through charitable foundations or organizations um, within the local community. Um, athletes helping out uh, athletes. Um, it's a nonprofit that provides like hand cycles uh, to children with disabilities at no cost to them. Um, we're actually trying to start up a little group here in, at Dell Children's um, to do uh, an adaptive cycling program. So we're going to try to provide uh, adaptive bicycles for kids um, here in the near future. But we're just trying to get everything organized. So. Um, Let's see here. Um, bear in mind that as um, as we have more athletes um, uh, or kiddos that are uh, with disabilities that are participating in um, sports, um, you also have to, have to bear in mind that um, there's a risk for injury. And so, um, getting to know your local sports medicine physician is is uh, can be helpful. Um, I sometimes send my kiddos before I even uh, recommend them for uh, adaptive sporting opportunities. Um, if I know what sport they're going to do, like uh, wheelchair racing or things like that, um, I'll send them to like physical therapy to kind of work on their propulsion mechanics. Um, uh, some for Special Olympics and um, Paralympics and stuff too, that you have to have like a physical um, to participate. Um, one of the more controversial um, topics that comes up is our kiddos with trisomy 21 and Down syndrome um, with uh, their higher risk for atlanoaxial instability, so getting cervical spine x-rays. It's not a, a complete like no if, if they have um, atlanoaxial instability, it's just that um, they have more limited um, sporting events that they can participate in, namely like contact sports um, that they can participate in. So. Um, let's see here. So whenever I'm looking at a kid um, to consider them for adaptive sports, um, the, the kind of things that I look out for is, you know, what are, what's the current status of their condition? Um, 
uh, like their, their, their current medical conditions. Um, are, are they stable or do they, are they still being worked up? Um, are we still treating and trying to get things under control? Um, how is their disease or injury process going to impact their, their stamina, their ability to, to acquire the skills to participate um, in that sport? Um, their overall interest, interest is the biggest thing. Um, so, you know, if they're not motivated or interested, then, you know, there's not really, um, uh, you know, motivation to, to, to help them get into these activities. So um, some of that comes from you too, like as, as a provider, you got to kind of motivate them or just let them know that there, there are these opportunities out there for them. Um, and then their underlying impairments, obviously, you know, like their, body, their body's ability to perform that work. So those are the kind of things that um, I look at specifically. Um, being aware that, you know, there might be some of it like sporting events that um, kids want to participate in that you, you're not sure. Um, there are different classification systems, especially when it comes into the um, competitive realm. So um, a lot of sports now that, uh, especially in the uh, competitive aspect of it, they'll classify kiddos based on their range of motion, whether they have limb deficiencies, like le even things like leg length differences, their stature, degree of spasticity. So they'll, they'll classify you and group you into different um, abilities based on your, your symptoms. Um, so it's good to know that. Um, and then what are the uh, opportunities? Like I said, you'd be very hard pressed to find any sort of um, adaptive or recreational opportunity that doesn't have an, 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 ad, an uh, adapted form. So um, first one that we can, and these next few slides are just kind of give you examples of what, um, uh, sent some samples of sports that are out there. So dance, there's um, adaptive uh, contemporary ballroom and classical styles of dance. Um, so uh, they'll, a lot of um, adaptive sports, uh, dance programs will incorporate um, uh, you know, if, if they have an amputee and they have a prosthesis, they'll incorporate that into um, their routines and things like that. There's wheelchair dancing as well. And there's um, something I learned about recently. There's actually competitive wheelchair um, classical ballroom dancing and um, classical dancing as well. So um, it's all about using their disability or their prosthesis or their DME as like kind of an extension of, um, uh, of, of the sport. So. Uh, scuba and snorkeling, actually surprisingly, um, one of the more um, accessible opportunities in the sense that um, you don't need a whole lot of adaptive equipment to participate in this. There are, you know, certain restrictions that you have to keep in mind um, and the number, the, some preclusions. So if they have like poorly uh, controlled seizures or certain pulmonary conditions, but um, you don't need a whole lot of um, equipment because most of the time they're going to have you participate with like um, a, an instructor. Um, you don't need, uh, sometimes we'll incorporate like a swim prosthesis or, or something of that sort um, to help them propel, but most of the time it's accompanied by an instructor and, and because the water kind of takes out the weight of um, or impact of stress or, or anything like on that on the body, um, that's uh, why this is one of the more accessible opportunities for kids. Um, there's martial arts. I know music is still not, not technically a sport, but there, there's still like adaptive music options. Um, this site here, Flute Lab, um, they have a whole uh, array of different um, uh, adaptations to, to use different instruments for. So there's like, uh, they have ones for guitars, violins, um, trumpets, uh, flutes, obviously, but um, all different kinds of things. Horseback riding therapy, as uh, others have touched on before, um, great for kiddos with like central hypotonia or poor head control um, to kind of develop some of that uh, core strength and trunk strength um, and head control. Um, usually done under, under some sort of uh, like a physical therapist or occupational therapist that's monitoring them. Um, I talked a bit about aquatic therapy already. Um, there's archery, baseball is, is another common one. Miracle League is a very big organization um, that's um, national um, and they take kids of all abilities. And so um, whether they'll find like something that, uh, some, some sort of way for them to participate. Um, they have uh, baseballs that um, emit like a beeping sound. Um, so if for kids that are like visually impaired, um, they can Use uh, that that uh, that use that as a means to participate in baseball. Um, they have uh, bases that have like that vibrate, and so like as the um, kids are running across, they can kind of feel the vibrations to know when to like turn and run to the next base. So, um, basketball. 
one of the more uh, one of the earliest sports that developed. Um, it's actually there, there's full blown like professional leagues um, for basketball. Um, they follow the NCAA college rules. Um, equipment consists of usually a sports wheelchair. Um, there's something called the super sport prosthesis, which is kind of just like a um, almost like a cupped. Uh, a terminal device at the end of a upper limb prosthesis. So that it kind of just helps you like scoop or palm the ball. Um, and we use that, um, that pros uh, specific prosthesis across a variety of different sports. Um, bowling's also a very um, accessible one. Um, there's lots of different adaptations. Um, there's, one, there's balls with like handles attached to them. Um, you can just use like a, a ramp or shoot to, to help um, guide the ball. Um, and they, they can use the gutter guards and stuff too to, to participate in that. Um, camping, mountaineering, hiking, paddling, you name it, you, you can find a way to, to, um, to, to do, do these kind of things. I've had a kiddo in a, wheelchair their family was very into uh, mountain climbing and I forgot which specific mountain but it was like several thousand feet high and, and they did that all and like he's he's a paraplegic and they, they found a way to, to kind of help him hike up there. Um, Cycling is also a very um, accessible uh, opportunity. They have a variety of different adaptations that you can do um, or add to for, for bicycles. Um, pedal adaptations where they can put um, shoe holders or sh straps. Um, back rests and harnesses, hand cycles, adaptive tricycles, um, tandem bicycles as well. Um, fishing, they have electric reels, they have um, uh, ramped piers now um, where uh, you, your wheelchair, that, that can be wheelchair, wheelchair accessible and straps to kind of hold them onto the chair um, so that they obviously don't fall, fall into the, the water. Um, American football, Hockey is another cool one as well. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen like sit skis before or, or, or sit sleds, but they, they um, incorporate that and they almost kind of like propel themselves with their upper extremities. Um, and then they have um, like different uh, 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 adaptive sticks and, and hockey sticks that, uh, that help them participate. Um, paddling and, and sports we talked about a little bit already too, but there's tons of adaptive kayaks, um, flotation devices, um, all things that that can help uh, uh, kids get into the water. Um, quad rugby is probably the most intense sport. Um, it, this is a full blown contact sport, so I encourage you guys to to take uh, if you guys are interested um, YouTube uh, uh, quad rugby, um, and you'll see how intense they they literally ram each other with their wheelchairs. And that's the this sport in particular has the highest um, injury rate um, of all the, all the uh, adaptive sports, um, and so. Um, there are specific rules with quad rugby. Um, in order to level the playing field, all, all paid, uh, players must have some form of tetraplegia. Um, they, the equipment they typically use is a, is a volleyball. They have different uh, gloves and straps, and then they have specific um, design chairs uh, with quad rugby chairs with anti-tippers, um, just because it's such a, a full-blown contact sport for them. Uh, this one on the bottom here, just to kind of give you an idea of what people can do um, with their abilities, just um, take a look at that guy on the on the bottom corner there. They they you'd be surprised um, how well they can play and how intense um, some of the the sports can get. Um, but soccer is one one I've had experience with with coaching in the past. Um, there's power wheelchair soccer. Um, there's the, the this form of soccer where they'll they'll use um, like forearm cr crutches and such um, to to play on you know regulation size fields and stuff. Um, same kind of deal too. They have like beeper soccer balls where they kind of emit sounds um, for um, people who are visually impaired. Um, and then last couple here, skiing um, and snowboarding. Um, so uh, there's uh, this. This is the sits um, the sit ski I was talking about a little bit earlier. So basically, it's just like a chair attached to. Um, some skis on the bottom, um, and then they have specialized straps and backrests and stuff um, that you can use to to go down downhill and things like that. Um, and for snowboards, for like for amputees and such, they have specific um, uh, stabilizers and thing, the sockets to insert the prosthesis into, so that um, you can participate in snowboarding as well too. There's track and field, um, tennis, table tennis. 
Um, some of the different rules with tennis, um, they allow for like two bounces instead of one bounce um, when you're returning the ball. Um, there's specialized rackets um, and positioning straps and racket holders um, for that. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's just a, a, a small sample, believe it or not, of, of all the different sporting opportunities that are available for, for kids. Um, you, we could have whole lectures about the different equipments and prosthesis and things like that. Um, unfortunately, don't, I don't have that much time, but um, if you guys have any questions, I'm always happy to, to answer for you guys, but yeah. Sometimes in primary care, we get the special Olympic form, you know, that we need to sign. Are there any reason that we shouldn't be signed for some patients? So, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely um, considerations for, I think it's sports specific. You should, um, especially like for, for example, for swimming, um, uncontrolled seizures um, or um, if they, some will give you like cautions, like if someone has like really bad ADHD or they can't pay attention and because of that reason, um, uh, they're deemed like not safe to, to swim or, or be in the water. Um, so each, um, if, if you go to each of the sporting events um, websites, they, they usually each of these sporting events, especially with the Special Olympics, they have their own websites and they'll have lists of um, contraindications or um, like uh, a diagnosis that they won't accept. So. Hey there. You said you're currently working to bring equipment to people with special needs here at DCMC. What's the current process with that? And then what else do you need to kind of be successful? It's really early on, um, but we're getting together with our um, rehab engineering department. Um, we are also going to be working with some local bike shops um, to provide parts um, and such. Um, uh, we're going to be starting pretty slow, like maybe making one or two adaptive bikes and kind of seeing how the program grows. Um, I, I did a couple, I did a program in fellowship um, where it was like a full blown, we, we did like an eight week summer um, program where uh, we would bring specific, uh, specific kids that would, uh, we thought would be good for an adaptive bike. Um, and we would do an eight week program where they would come like once a week um, and they would um, kind of trial the bike out. We would make adjustments on a week by week basis. And at the end of the eight weeks, we did like a marathon um, with all the kids um, who, when, with their finished bikes. So we're trying to do there. Cool. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you.